Hey guys, tonight we're going to talk about other respiratory disorders. So there's a couple miscellaneous disorders um, within the this section. So I'm going to kind of just give you an overview of those to hopefully help break them down and differentiate them. So first there's what's called acute bronchitis. Um, and what this is, a lot of people mix this up with chronic bronchitis, which is, you know, related to COPD. But what acute bronchitis is, this is an inflammation, because I always think, you know, itis is an inflammation, and then of the um, airway, which is the bronchioles, um, and it's usually caused by a virus. Um, and usually what this patient's going to come in and complain about is, hey, I've had a cold, but the cough hasn't gone away. I've had a cough for weeks or months. Um, they may have other cold symptoms like a fever, feel general weakness, chest pressure. Um, the thing about this is it's usually self-limiting, uh, but we, what we want to do is prevent further infection. So teach them very good hygiene and, um, you know, how to help prevent this in the future. Uh, and we are going to help treat those symptoms. They may need a cough suppressant. And keep in mind, generally, we don't like to use cough suppressants because we want people to cough stuff up. But with these patients, they've been coughing so much, so much that it's maybe they're not even sleeping. So sometimes that priority to make sure they're getting rest and to help this um, virus to pass um, is more important than, um, you know, trying to make sure that they cough stuff up. We definitely don't want to get too extreme with that stuff, but um, we may need to use. Um, it's what's called an antitussive or tussa, it might be tussive, um, but um, it helps to suppress that cough reflex. Uh, we may also give antipyretics or like acetaminophen if they have a fever. We're also going to encourage fluids because fluids help to thin secretions and pretty much every respiratory disorder, we're going to encourage fluids um, because we want pretty much that sputum to come up and the best way it can come up is if we thin out those secretions. Let's talk about bronchiectasis. And this is one that a lot of people find very confusing because it has a funny name. <laughs> and uh, it's different than a lot of other things we talked about. This is the only disease that involves dilation of the airway. When I say dilation, I mean open. So like, you know, most of the disease we talked about, like the airway being closed, constricted, um, narrow. This one, it's wide open. So you would think, oh, that's a good thing. Um, but it actually what happens is, is that like in order for, you know, air and, or sorry, in order for mucus and things to move, there needs to be at least some constriction, but there's so much dilation, mucus just gets stuck. And what happens, kind of think of it like plaque in your arteries. Don't worry, we're going to get soon to that if you don't know what I'm talking about. Cardiac is just around the corner. Um, but um, what do you call it? Uh, pretty much what happens is mucus accumulates um, and like plaque in arteries, it stays there and it causes a blockage. So pretty much think of this like an obstruction to the airway. All this mucus gets stuck and has nowhere to go because there's no squeeze to help get that mucus out. This is a permanent dilation. So when a patient gets this, um, there's no reversing it. There is some treatments and things like that, but most of it is supportive just to try to help to prevent complications. Um, we're going to, um, for this patient, you're going to expect to find thick, purulent sputum and coarse lung sounds, you know, and so that's what, that's a little bit different. While, you know, some of the other diseases we've talked about, um, there's mucus accumulation, blocked airway and stuff like that. This is thick, purulent sputum and the lung sounds are coarse. Remember with like asthma and COPD, they have that wheezing with all that mucus. With this patient, they have the dilation. So they actually have wet lung sounds because they're just accumulating all of this purulent sputum because they can't get it out. So the priorities for this patient and you know, the treatments are going to be to keep the airway open. So we keep the airway open with medications like bronchodilators, um, like albuterol and things like that to keep it open, um, decreasing the inflammatory process through steroids and getting the mucus up through treatments like that CPT or that chest percussion therapy. Um, you know, it's really going to be important for this patient to um, increase their fluid intake and uh, make sure we're doing as much as we can to get that mucus out. Because, you know, because that mucus is just staying in their, in their um, airways, they're at high risk for infection. So a lot of these patients need regular antibiotic therapy. So we're going to do all these things to support them um, in order to um, help to like prevent complications from this and help them moving forward to, um, you know, prevent them from having further infections and things like that. There's also what's called pleural effusion. We think effusion, kind of think fluid. So this is fluid in the pleural space or in the lung space. I mean, that's the space between, um, you know, the two layers of the lung, not inside the lung, not outside. It's kind of in the middle space. There's a sac around um, the lung and it, there's a uh, fluid kind of accumulates there. 
it's usually caused by an infection um, or like, you know, if you have liver disease or some GI problems, um, it can um, lead to a pleural effusion as well. And it makes it really hard to take deep breaths because pretty much what happens, kind of think of it like it starts to hug your lung, but it, it, it takes up the space of your lung. So your lung can't expand as much. So it's kind of the same idea as like, um, think with like people that are obese, that their stomach is, uh, we call it, um, it's so large that it kind of presses up and it prevents the lungs from expanding. So it, it takes up space and decreases the ability for expansion of the lungs. And the pleural effusion does the same thing. These patients are going to complain that it's hard to take deep breaths. They're going to have diminished lung sounds. Um, and um, really, it's a lot of that, like, we're going to need to do a really thorough um, uh, we cut respiratory assessment, check their oxygen saturations, and really look at that work of breathing that they're doing because it can be very hard. Um, <clears throat> our primary treatment, of course, is going to be to remove that fluid. So we can sometimes use medications like diuretics, but we can also use um, treatments like a thoracentesis. And a thoracentesis is where we stick a needle, not us as the nurse, but the doctor. They um, get an ultrasound and they stick a needle in that lung space and drain that fluid. And sometimes they may even put a chest tube in. Um, if infection was the cause, we may need antibiotics to help resolve that. Um, and along the way, they may need supportive oxygen therapy to kind of help with that, um, you know, that since their inability, they're not able to have complete gas exchange, um, we can help with that by giving supplemental oxygen. There's also what's known as pleurisy. I always want to call it pleurisy. And if you're in my class, you'll hear me call it pleurisy isn't easy. Um, this is uh, the, we call it a lot of the miscellaneous lung disorders I've talked about can cause pain, but if you're thinking pain in a lung disorder, this is the one. Pleuri pleurisy, I'm going to say it right now, pleurisy um, is the uh, inflammation of the lung that leads to pains. So this is the one most associated with pain. The pain is the biggest complaint usually in these patients. Um, it's usually related to infection. It can be from cancer treatments like radiation to the chest or trauma to the chest wall. Um, and pain, they're going to complain pain is worse when they inhale. Um, you're going to listen for what's called a pleural flick, bleh, pleural friction rub. And what the pleural friction rub, um, is, is, is pretty much the, like the, that lining that we just talked about with the pleural effusion, um, that has all the fluid in it. It actually like that fluid leaves. And like, so the lining of the lung just kind of rubs against each other and it makes this kind of squeaking door sound. Um, but we want to listen for that because that's usually a sign of pleurisy. Um, and then, of course, we want, the treatment's going to involve whatever the underlying cause is. So if the cancer treatments are causing it, we're probably going to have to put a halt to the cancer treatments until this resolves. If there's infection, we want to treat that. If there's trauma, they may need surgery or other help treating that trauma. Um, and then give them supportive care. Anti-inflammatories can be very helpful because this is an inflammatory process. And we want to do splinting. And splinting is where you put like a pillow to the chest. Like if I was having pain, like trouble breathing, if I'm pushing down like when I'm taking a deep breath, it helps to take away some of that pain since I'm not, it will help me to not expand so much. And this may sound counterintuitive, but I actually like these patients to sleep on the affected side or lie on the affected side. So let's say that I had pleurisy on um, my right side over here, um, then I would wanna lay on that side because that actually helps to splint or puts pressure on that side where my lung doesn't have to expand so much. So it decreases that inflammation that comes like every, because remember it's pain worse on inhalation. So every time I inhale, it's kind of doing a forced splint for me. It's putting pressure so that that expansion doesn't happen so that I don't have that immense pain that I'm having because my lungs trying to expand, but it's inflamed. There's also what's known as atelectasis. And what atelectasis is, is it's where um, the place where gas exchange occurs in the bottom of the lungs, um, they collapse. Um, and so um, pretty much what happens is, is that like your ability for gas exchange decreases. Um, you know, it's usually caused because people will be like in the hospital and they'll have surgery and they're like, oh, I don't feel like taking deep breaths. They're tired, they're on medications. Um, they have pain, they don't feel like taking breaths. Um, and so what happens is eventually those, um, they kind of like a balloon, like they deflate. Um, but these pretty much collapse, which, you know, that means that oxygen is not getting into those to help to oxygenate the body. So atelectasis can commonly lead to pneumonia and other complications. So we definitely want to try to prevent it. Um, 
The main symptom we're going to notice is diminished lung sounds. We may notice a change to their um, vital signs, including their oxygen saturation, but usually the first thing we notice is just very diminished, like, hey, they need to take deeper breaths. We want to encourage them to do turn, cough, and deep breathe. Um, you know, regular movement is really helpful in that incentive spirometer. So usually that's ordered to be done every hour while awake, but most patients don't do it that often. So it's our job kind of like when we're doing our hourly rounding to go in and be like, hey, have you done your incentive spirometer? And just encourage them to do it, take those breaths, because um, that can make a big difference between them um, having complications with their atelectasis. Last but not least, there's environmental lung disease. And what this is, is something that looks a lot like COPD, but the cause is due to a chemical or dust exposure. Um, so when you're thinking the symptoms of what it looks like, it's gonna sound a lot like COPD. <coughs> and I promise I'm not doing that for dramatic effect. Um, it's gonna sound a lot like COPD, uh, or sorry, look a lot like COPD, but it's, um, it's different. So um, people that work like, you know, like farmers that are around pesticides or people that are coal miners or that work in a chemical plant, um, they're exposed to chemicals um, and sometimes they don't always know it or they're not wearing the right protective equipment. And so sometimes then 10 to 15 years later, they start getting like a COPD like illness. Um, they can have shortness of breath, breath wheezing, weight loss, um, a lot of respiratory difficulty, things like that. Um, so as a whole, we um, provide supportive care for these patients. We want to support oxygenation. So we give them medications like albuterol or bronchodilators to prevent um, that bronchoconstriction, we give them oxygen, and then also help to get mucus up through that chest percussion therapy or CPT. Um, of course, we want to try to prevent this whenever possible. So uh, making sure that their workplace is safe, that they're wearing that protective equipment. I mean, some of that stuff can be annoying, but... <coughs> excuse me, this um, chronic lung diseases, uh, trust me, and this is something that you can't reverse. Um, it's definitely um, worthwhile to wear that equipment in order to prevent a much bigger problem. So we just want to make sure that their um, workplace is being safe and that they're following their workplace's guidelines. So if we identify someone who's at risk, then we want to make sure that they know about this. That is other um, respiratory disorders. I hope that this was very helpful for you to kind of get started in these disorders and different processes. I will see you on the next one.